Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. Today, we have the great pleasure of partnering with our colleagues in Warsaw, Poland, with the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding for our ninth annual Transatlantic Forum on Russia. Now, pre-pandemic, we would have been having an all-day conversation at CSIS and our, our Washington, D.C. headquarters for an all-day conversation about Russia. Unfortunately, the pandemic has put this into a virtual format, uh, and we will be having a series of conversations in the coming weeks uh, to fulfill that mission of the Transatlantic Forum on Russia. Over a decade ago, this conversation was very much about understanding Polish-Russian rapprochement and what it meant for the region and transatlantic relations. In 2014, our conversation dramatically changed with the illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia's military incursion into Donbass. Then it transformed into the Transatlantic Forum on Russia, where it was essential for the United States and Europe to join in a singular focus and policy towards Russia. Of course, this year we have so much to talk about uh, with the August 9th failed Belarusian presidential elections, uh, 
two weeks after that, we had the uh, poisoning of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. We've had lots of conversations about extension of the New START treaty, uh, Russian election interference, uh, Nord Stream 2 energy issues. So the agenda is very, very full. And we look forward to diving into that conversation with two of the most senior officials from the United States and Poland to help us unpack and understand all of those issues. We invite our audience to submit questions uh, via the, the, the live question feature uh, on this invitation. You just hit that link to the button and send us those questions and we'll bring them into the conversation. This will be a true transatlantic conversation. It will be co-moderated by my colleague, Ernest uh, uh who is uh, the executive director of the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding. So Ernest, let me turn this over to you and then you can uh, welcome and introduce Deputy Secretary Steve Began. Over to you. Thank you, Heather. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone watching, uh, depending on time zone. It's really great that in spite of those unfortunate circumstances that made it impossible for us to meet in person, we survived and managed to, to adapt to this situation. The show must go on, and, and that's, that's great. Uh, for us, for the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue Understanding, our annual transatlantic forum on Russia with CSIS has transformed into highly valuable tradition. So I'm very happy that we still keep this tradition. Uh, just a couple of words about uh, Center for those who don't know us. Uh, we are a public entity established uh, 10 years ago almost. And what we do is quite simple. It, 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 it is in the name of the institution. I mean, fostering dialogue between Poles and Russians, Poland and Russia, where it is possible. Uh, what we do is this kind of um, public events, conferences, seminars, youth exchange, scholarships, publishing, and many, many other uh, projects that actually mostly uh, help us to foster some connections between Polish and Russian uh, society. Uh, so this is uh, this forum belongs to one of the of our um, uh, projects that we uh, do in partnership. This th this time with uh, uh, CSIS, uh, trying to look from transatlantic perspective on Russia, because what we do is not just speak with Russians, but also about Russia. And this is what the Transatlantic Forum, uh, Transatlantic Forum is about. Is, is about. Uh, and I'm really happy that we can have such a strong introduction to this year's uh, uh, series of talks that we will gonna have online. Uh, and this is because of our distinguished guests. And let me first introduce uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Mr. Stephen Bigan. Uh, thank you, Secretary, for joining us. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Uh, uh, before having been sworn as a Deputy Secretary of State on December last year, uh, Mr. Pigan has had three decades of experience in government, uh, in both executive and legislative branch, as well as in private sector. In the early 90s, Mr. Pigan served as a director of the Moscow Office of Interna Inter International Republican Institute. Then for many years, he worked as a foreign policy advisor uh, to members of both the House of Representatives and the US Senate and held many positions there, including the Chief of Staff of the US Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. In 2001-2003, uh, Mr. Began served as Executive Secretary of the National Security Council. Then he moved to private sector, working as a Vice President of International Governmental Relations of the Ford Motor Company. And then he came back to public sector in August 2018, uh, when he was appointed as a special U.S. representative for North Korea, uh, so as you can see, uh, a lot of a lot of experience, practical uh, from business sphere, from public sphere. So thank you once again for joining us, and let me, without further ado, uh, start this conversation uh, and address the first question to you, Deputy Secretary. Uh, since Russia has been at the core of of um, of this forum from the very beginning. Let me start from very quite general framework type of question. Could you please briefly outline uh, U.S. policy towards Russia? Russia that sees U.S. as its one of its main adversaries and seeks challenge to U.S. interest in many parts of the world. How should we read U.S. policy towards Russia right now? Mr. Secretary, please. 
Well, thank you, Ernest. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with you and uh, Heather, as well as uh, with my counterpart in Poland, uh, Marcin. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, for giving me a chance to, to share some thoughts with you on uh, a set of issues that's very near and dear to me. Um, not only uh, have I uh, worked in Russia, but I lived in Russia, I studied in Russia, and really uh, the Soviet Union, uh, to be more precise. And, and, and really for me, uh, this has been uh, one of the uh, central uh, issues that I've grappled with throughout my career in foreign policy, as well as in the private sector where I spent quite a bit of time in Russia. The U.S. policy towards Russia right now, I'd say, is, is largely a steady state. I do think there is some uh, desire uh, here in the United States, and, and it's, not, uh, it's not on one side or the other of the political divide. I think it's, it's found uh, in both parties. There is some desire to find an opening, a way forward to uh, explore areas of cooperation between the United States and Russia to get past the very low point that we find ourselves at uh, in the post-Cold War relationship. The, um, uh, that uh, that uh, appetite that I'm describing for exploring possibilities it can be uh, most clearly found in, a, in two open letters that were published earlier this year, uh, each signed by a broad set of Russia experts here in the United States of America, uh, advocating very different courses, but uh, but the uh, interesting thing about the letters was that the, the authorship was so diverse across Republicans and Democrats, uh, across uh, former administration officials and, uh, and outside experts. The, uh, the, the argument boiled down, uh, uh, simply put, into whether or not to simply sustain a steady pressure on Russia until Russia changes its behavior, or uh, to match that steady pressure with an engagement that could possibly create space to move forward in U.S.-Russia relations. Now, I, uh, I, I haven't been uh, uh, shy in saying that I'm, I'm actually uh, more in the latter camp, that uh, as a senior U.S. official, and certainly this is the view of the, the president and the secretary of state, that we should have a, a discussion uh, with the Russian Federation, with the, the officials that, that lead Russia, um, even as we have areas of deep disagreement where we push back or even impose penalties on Russia. But notwithstanding that that desire, uh, the reality that I've confronted is that there's just very little space to have that discussion. And that's for a variety of reasons. Some of it is shifting priorities and inconsistent uh, 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 views here in the even in our own administration. We have been a little bit all over the map on Russia, admittedly, and there are places where we engage with Russia uh, outside of U.S.-Russia relations, for example, Syria, that consume an enormous amount of time and energy. Uh, but but it, it, as much as that is, is part of the issue, there's, there's still two other factors that play a big role. One is that Russia has become a very politicized foreign policy issue here in the United States of America. Uh, and one that I think it uh, was used, unfortunately, even as a political cudgel for uh, much of the early parts of this administration and really precluded any possibility of, of getting any traction and engagement. But the last issue and by far the, th the third reason and by far the most overwhelming reason is there's no space. I'm a very practical person. I'm, I'm prepared to sit down with Russian counterparts and explore uh, where we can find areas of agreement even as we have areas of deep disagreement. But uh, the reality is that uh, we haven't had any period of time in this relationship over the past few years where we have enough political space to do that, whether it's the uh, uh, Russian uh, invasion of, and, and annexation of, of, crime, of Crimea and eastern Ukraine, uh, whether it's uh, the, uh, their uh, manipulations in Belarus or their, uh, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny or any number of other uh, matters. It has simply shrunk the space that we have for that discussion. So where I'd say, uh, Ernest, in some where I would say the U.S.-Russia relationship stands today is uh, in, a, in a very steady but, uh, but negative state uh, with uh, so far little opportunity for improvement. And uh, that improvement will only happen, well, must uh, that improvement can only happen if First, you find sentiment and willingness here in the United States. And second, if the Russian Federation is serious enough about such engagement that they suspend some of the very 
uh, very dangerous or worrisome uh, policies and actions that we've seen in recent years. Thank you so very much. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Under Secretary of State for Security, the Americas, Asia, and Eastern Policy, Marcin Pashidach. Um, I, the, the picture and the image of the world behind you is, it sounds like your responsibilities. You have a very wide remit <laughs> prior to being uh, becoming Under Secretary. Um, um, Mr. Pashidach served uh, from 2015 to 2019 as the Deputy Director uh, in the Office of Foreign Affairs for Polish President Duda, uh, a lawyer by training and a think tanker, which we, we all approve of uh, from the think tank space. Uh, Marcin, we are delighted to have you. And I, I'm going to actually ask you the very same question. What is the state of the Polish government's approach and policy uh, towards Russia? Uh, as Steve described it as a steady state, uh, but with very, very diminishing uh, space for conversation. It has been a very difficult last three to four months with events uh, that we've seen uh, very close to Poland. So we would welcome your, your reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me here. And thank you very much for organizing this beautiful um, 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 event with uh, such a uh, distinguished guest as uh, Deputy Secretary Biggin. So thank you. Thank you once again for, for, for the, this discussion is very timely, really. I mean, we have to discuss the, the transatlantic relations and uh, and we cannot uh, discuss it without uh, without the topic of Russia, of course, because it is it is important uh, issue for um, all of us. And, and and when it comes to the security um, agenda, of course, Russia is the main is the main topic. So uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Let me apologize that I'm in a bit less formal environment. I'm just self isolated because of the contact with the person. So uh, without maybe Polish and the, and the European flag at this very moment. So if I might briefly about the about the Polish and the EU policies towards uh, Russia, since we are the member of the of the of the of the EU, and uh, it is not only our policy, but also the European should be. I mean, the the, the position of the EU towards uh, towards Russia. Uh, of course, we are in a very very important uh, um, moment right now, and with the uh, already mentioned Navalny's poisoning, with the Kremlin in, in involvement in Belarus, and the ongoing um, discussion on five guiding. Um, the principles in the in the background and the assassination attempt on the leading political uh, opponents uh, uh, of Kremlin with the use of uh, illegal uh, chemical um, uh, weapon and illegally pursued multi-year prison um, uh, sentence against uh, Mr. Dmitriev, uh, um, uh, UN reports concerning dire human rights um, the situation in the occupied Crimea, also mentioned by um, uh, Mr. Begum, um, once again it turned our um, our attention or the public attention uh, into the problem of human rights um, violation committed by the by the Kremlin, and all of this remind us, uh, I would say, the true nature of the Putin's um, uh, um, regime. It is yet another um, example of Kremlin's total lack of respect for the basic. Um, the principle of international law, uh, human rights, and uh, and and democracy. Um, so while the EU reactions to Navalny's poisoning was a determined one, with a very strong EU Parliament uh, resolution and uh, and a swift swift adoption of uh, of sanctions against those responsible, we have to, as Poland and uh, and the European Union, we have to ensure that our decisiveness does not water down too um, too quickly. Uh, for the time being, um, there is no place to, uh, for the return to the business uh, as usual. We know that some countries, especially in the western part of our continent, they would love to come back to the business as usual with Russia. But I would say that there is no room for that at this very moment. First, Russia has to stop hampering the investigation and Kremlin must uh, reveal the truth behind the Hyder's crime. So, uh, and Russia has not met obligations stemming the, uh, from the uh, Minsk agreement either which um, under EU5 guiding principle is a key condition for any substantial change in the EU stance towards um, uh, uh, this country. We cannot forget about the ongoing illegal occupation of Crimea and Sevastopol. Grave human rights violation committed there by the occupying force were documented um, in the uh, United Nations report. So, and the persistent det um, the deterioration of the civil rights in Russian um, the Federation shall be also regularly addressed by the by the EU um, because our credibility, I would say, is at 
at stake um, um, now. We have to boldly condemn con uh, continuous violation of international law and express our strong support to the civil um, society in, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, and we shall not forget about the rules that we all share. Respect for uh, such basic um, rules of the international law, sovereignty of all nations, uh, um, due regard for um, uh, um, human rights and um, uh, the democracy. And when talking with uh, Russia, it doesn't matter if it's R Poland, EU, uh, um, or, or the United States, the West should always demand that Moscow follow this, um, uh, these rules. Human rights should be paramount topic in all engagement with, uh, um, with Kremlin. Uh, um, Poland, uh, I would say, is very realistic. We know that uh, we have to keep some fields um, of principle-based engagement with, um, with Russia open, of course. Uh, and we must remember, um, uh, however, that um, we are by far economically stronger uh, partner and uh, that Russia is not the main trade partner for, for, the, for, for the European Union. It is on Kremlin's side at this very moment to prove that uh, uh, they really want closer cooperation with us, with Europe. Uh, and the Navalny case uh, once again shows us how unreal, uh, unreliable uh, partner Russia uh, actually is. Uh, uh, it would be a grave political and economic mistake to base future of our energy policy uh, on gas and hydrogen important uh, uh, from Russia, especially through um, uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So the, this pipeline project has been a disaster to the EU and we totally support US actions uh, aimed at security uh, at securing our um, our position. So just to sum up, uh, only such multi-factored comprehensive um, approach toward uh, Russia can lead to the uh, situation where EU is safer uh, and its vital interests are, uh, are protected. So I believe that um, proper analysis of a response to the Navalny poisoning is a good, it's just a good starting point to shape such a better policy uh, for the future. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Secretary. Uh, next question is concern, concerns uh, strategic issues, uh, strategic stability and regional stability. Uh, the first part is about New START Treaty. And as we all know, this is the only bilateral nuclear arms control agreement that still binds the US and Russia, and it's about to expire soon. So Putin has now proposed one year extension. We know there is another actor on the rise, actually, who, which is not subject to any treaty restrictions. Uh, so what shall we expect from US policy in this, in this domain? But then also from the regional perspective, uh, it's excellent that you mentioned those two letters, American letters, when it comes to Russian policy, because also was the, the third one comes from, that came from Europe. There was a, a, a many European experts and policy former and current policymakers responded somehow to this US uh, debate on Russia policy with their own proposals, what shall we do? And it re uh, with a with a general message that that you uh, it would be great if U.S. would look more closely to the regional concerns about Russian policy, and it is related to the second part of the question about NATO, future U U.S. NATO policy, uh, in the context of both start negotiations if they happen, and uh, in, in the context of for future U.S. Uh, policy um, uh, towards Europe generally. Well, thank you, Ernest. <clears throat> uh, on your first uh, question on strategic issues, the United States has now held several rounds of bilateral negotiations with Russia in Vienna and, and in, uh, in Helsinki in order to try to craft a way forward on the New START agreement. I think the general disp disposition of both countries is that uh, they support strategic arms control uh, that they uh, would like to see an extension of New Start, but the the rub is is under what circumstances, with what conditions, with what uh, with what modifications. The um, initially the United States uh, pressed for the inclusion of the People's Republic of China in this discussion for the reasons you alluded to. The, one of the fastest growing nuclear arsenals in the world today is in the People's Republic of China. And while it still sh uh, it falls well short of the levels that were attained by uh, the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, uh, and, and still even with the reductions that the Soviet Union and then Russian Federation and the United States agreed to in the intervening years, um, the trajectory for China's strategic buildup is, is uh, uh, quite alarming in terms of its effect on 
global strategic uh, stability. Um, without a doubt, China is now a third party uh, in the strategic arms uh, 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 of global consequence. We have many other nuclear powers with regional uh, uh, interest that is uh, addressed by strategic arms, but we, uh, China now is overwhelmingly uh, uh, separated itself from the remainder of those countries. Uh, China, uh, like all other signatories of the non-proliferation treaty is obliged to continuously apply best efforts on the reduction of strategic weapons as part of the basic bargain of the non-proliferation treaty, which is that uh, countries without the weapon will agree not to pursue it and countries with the weapon will agree uh, to continuous efforts to reduce it. The United States has done that over decades. Even the Soviet Union has done that over decades. At times, the negotiations have been contentious. At times, there have been buildups that precede reductions, but nonetheless, I'd say the continuum for both the Soviet Union and the United States or uh, later Russia and the United States was a steady reduction in those forces as the, uh, meeting their ob not only meeting their obligations for the treaty, but, a, but a, a, uh, an awareness among policymakers that, that limits on strategic weapons serves uh, the global interest, not just the national interest. Uh, China's stubbornly refused to date to participate in those discussions, but as we approach the, the uh, review conference of the non-proliferation treaty next year, um, I believe pressure will continue to grow in China to enter those discussions. But between the United States and Russia, we reached uh, something of a plateau about uh, three weeks ago where uh, President Putin directed his negotiators to accept a one-year extension uh, uh, and to include in it, a, as, as requested by the United States, a freeze on uh, warheads. One of the concerns that uh, continues to nag at us is that even as we reduce delivery systems and arms control treaties, warheads themselves still exist in huge abundance. And so the effort is really to begin get at the reductions of the warheads as well. It's a little more difficult to do. Uh, believe it or not, it's difficult to de define exactly what is a nuclear warhead, but even beyond uh, uh, reaching an agreed definition, uh, the uh, monitoring uh, and the uh, uh, of limitations on warheads will be challenging. But nonetheless, this is a very important area of priority. And it's one that the United States and Russia seem to have agreed, at least in general principle. Now we've had an intervening election uh, and we have a treaty that's running out of uh, uh, expiring in early February. And I'm sure uh, I'm not letting betraying any secrets uh, here that, that the Russian Federation is certainly making a calculation based upon whether they want to lock in an agreement with an extension now or wait until after January 20th to see if there's a better offer that they can possibly acquire. Uh, I think that's still a bit of a gamble, uh, perhaps less so than it was uh, uh, seemed it might have been two weeks ago, uh, but that's very much for the Russian Federation to agree. As far as the uh, this administration is concerned, we're prepared to go forward with an agreement. We're prepared to lock in a, uh, a freeze on warheads as a small uh, additional step towards strategic stability regionally and globally uh, between the United States and, and Russia. On your second question on, on the future uh, 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 of NATO uh, in relation to Russia, I think it's uh, I think it's plagued by many of the same uh, tendencies that Marcin uh, mentioned a moment ago in his remarks. That um, there's not a uniform opinion on on uh, Russia in Europe or in the United States for that matter, and so it is challenging to NATO to figure out exactly what is the right disposition. The the uh, without a doubt the the continued importance of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of the Alliance itself has to be focused on a clear understanding of the threats or at least challenges emanating from Russia. And by the way, you don't need to be a NATO member uh, to be, uh, to be uh, acquainted with those. Many of our Scandinavian friends and partners who are not allies in NATO understand full well uh, the risks that they face as well as the NATO members like the Baltic states, Poland, uh, and, and others who, who are uh, uh, either border or are close to Russian territory. Russia is still very much a consideration in the context of NATO. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a uh, um, mission that the alliance has to be well prepared for. It's hard to do in an era in, an era in which there is some cognitive dissonance, uh, because at the same time that we are seeking to make sure that we have prepared uh, adequately to defend the North Atlantic area, from any uh, any further misbehavior by the Russian Federation, 
we're also still positioning our societies, even in this low point in relations, for some level of engagement, uh, not just politically, but in terms of commerce as well. And, and some of this uh, is of such consequence that it, it bleeds into the discussion about NATO. For example, uh, adding to the dependency of Western Europe upon Russian energy resources seems to us a far more uh, alarming weakening of European security than the withdrawal of troops from Germany. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, uh, the whole premise of our posture, the United States military posture in Europe is to defend uh, the European space uh, from military attack. Now, there are other important roles that NATO plays, including in uh, promoting strategic relations among European countries, stability and military reforms within European countries. But ultimately, the core mission of NATO is to protect Europe. Uh, from uh, from outside attack. And I, I, I'm afraid that we're moving at different speeds and at times even in different directions when it comes to that essential point uh, between uh, various NATO members, including the United States and some of our, our NATO allies. So uh, it, it's a challenging environment and one in which, uh, which uh, whoever is the president on January 21st is going to have to make a huge priority to do. Um, I would say, uh, for, uh, from my point of view, um, that uh, the nation will be, uh, the, the alliance will be in a much better place. The uh, resources of the alliance have reversed a dangerous uh, reduction over a long period of time and begun to uh, build up as European countries begin to take more seriously their commitments to the alliance and, and more responsibility uh, for the defense of the alliance territory. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a much harder political issue than it is a, a, a military issue or uh, a, a matter of the physicals of the alliance, but they all have to work together in concert. So uh, Russia will still be, uh, Ernest, Russia will still be a central concern of the alliance as I think it is uh, for uh, many in, in Poland in, in particular. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, for the foreseeable future, that's gonna be an important uh, role for the alliance. Hey, thank you so much. We were getting a lot of questions about exactly where the New START Treaty extension discussions were. So thank you so much for that clarification. But Jean, I'm going to turn a little bit and sort of unpack a little of part of the U.S.-Russian negotiation regarding New START was getting that warhead freeze, but it was also bringing in the concept of all nuclear weapons, both strategic and non-strategic. There's tactical nuclear weapons that are a very strong concern to our European colleagues and haven't been included in, a, in an arms control treaty. I'd, I'd welcome your reflections uh, on, on that and sort of getting to those uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Kaliningrad, of course, is always a constant concern uh, for the region. And then the second part of the question, again, is pulling on a, a thread uh, that, that Steve was, was suggesting, and that's the political unity of NATO. In part, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has launched this uh, strategic reflection process to look at NATO until 2030. And a core of examining that is political unity of the alliance, which has undergone, while defense spending has gone up, uh, the political unity of, the, uh, of NATO has become much more fragile. And in some ways, Poland plays an important role in, in shoring up that unity, but could also play a role in, in, in fragmenting the unity. So I would welcome your thoughts on what, what Poland would like to see coming out of the strategic reflection process, getting to the point of, of, of political unity being, in fact, our center of gravity with a strong and robust military. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, when it comes to New START, of course, I mean, we are closely following the negotiations uh, um, uh, between Moscow and, 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 and Washington about the, the New START. Uh, we know that we are in a bit new reality right now. We, will, we don't know yet what will be the outcome of the, of, of the final outcome of the election, but uh, um, whatever it will be, I, I hope that the, the negotiation will be, uh, I mean, there will be continuation of the negoti negotiation and finally the, there will be a, um, a decision about the, about the new start, of, as you said, not only about the uh, tactical, but uh, the strategical, but strategic, but also the tactical uh, the weapons, which are for us especially, uh, in Poland, very um, dangerous, I, I would say. So we are um, uh, uh, absolutely uh, 
with the, with the U.S. I mean, supporting the U.S. position uh, to not not only to concentrate. Uh, um, on, on just signing the document, but also to to um, build a whole architecture of the security and 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 um, uh, on our, in this part of uh, of the world uh, and um, uh, in, in the in the European region and and the transatlantic uh, region, of course. Uh, uh, and I uh, and of course it, the new start, the whole the discussion uh, shouldn't be only with Russia because we have another actor. Um, and Steve already mentioned that we have another um, actor very uh, active uh, on the global scene, which is um, which is China, of course. Um, uh, uh, a bit, I mean, not that close to Poland as uh, as it is, but uh, the, the natural threat for us is uh, as Kaliningrad and the um, weapons deployed uh, um, uh, down there. So uh, we hope uh, that uh, finally there will be there will be a, um, a good decision. Um, according also to the um, to the American um, interest and the Polish in, interest, in, which in this case are very um, very um, similar. And the question about the unity of the of the alliance, uh, you know, Poland was always uh, very pro-Atlantic, and we uh, it doesn't matter who, whoever we are. I mean, from which part of the political scene, uh, all of us uh, we are very pro pro pro-Atlantic. We believe that. Uh, uh, transatlantic cooperation should be a foundation for the um, global security. We are the, uh, I would say, two parts of the same civilization. I mean, two continents, European and American, we are one big um, family. And uh, having said that, I would say that the whole um, architecture should be based on, on, on that good um, cooperation. Uh, but as you know, it takes two to tango, uh, and uh, it shouldn't be only the, the U.S. Uh, interested in the closer cooperation with uh, with Europe, but also Europe should be interested in a better cooperation with uh, um, um, with, uh, with with the U.S. And uh, two percent of GDP spending on security—that's that's 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 the question. I mean, we all agreed um, in Wales that we'll be spending two percent on uh, of our GDP for security, uh, and unfortunately, not every. A single um, uh, NATO member are fulfilling this uh, obligation, uh, and let me remind that the decision was taken um, by the previous administration in in, in Washington. So uh, it's bipartisan, I would say. Not only the Republicans, uh, not only President Trump, but also the the Dem Democrats uh, were supporting that kind of uh, um, approach. And we are fulfilling as Poland uh, our duties. We are on the eastern flank, and we are doing our um, um, job. Although we are not. The richest country in the in the whole um, um, alliance. So for the unity, I would say that every everyone should do their they, they, they job. As uh, the Americans, the Poles, but also Germans, uh, uh, French, and 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 other um, uh, other um, uh, members. So um, and the, and what what is even more important, I would say that the American presence in in in, in, in Europe, since we are uh, one big family, as I said. Uh, we should closely cooperate, but uh, the, the American presence, that was the uh, what guaranteed the security and the peace of uh, uh, in this part of the of the world for the last uh, 70 um, years or 60, 60, 60 a couple of years. Uh, uh, so we call for a, a strong U.S. political and military engagement in, 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 in Europe. Uh, it's an operationally um, resilient American force posture in Europe has been vital. Uh, I would say to maintain a proper uh, NATO defense and deterrence uh, posture with good uh, uh, interoperability uh, between um, uh, between allies. Uh, and uh, since it was mentioned by um, uh, by Deputy uh, Secretary, the withdrawing of of American troops, uh, I would say that we also follow closely information on the possible uh, American posture, um, uh, false posture uh, changes in in in, in Europe. Uh, and we took notes of of the intention to withdraw those twelve thousand U.S. military personnel from uh, from Germany and their uh, par partial um, um, repositioning to other uh, NATO um, uh, countries. I believe. I mean, this, we understand that uh, Washington is still in the process of um, assessing the political and operational implication of the uh, possible um, uh, moves. But I do really hope, and not only me, about the whole Polish administration. Um, that the, the decision regarding U.S. basing and force posture in the European th uh, theater will be well tailored to meet the security uh, challenges of the, of the Eastern flank. 
thank you. Uh, now a quick question about what's happening here and now, at, at, at actually very close to Poland. As we speak, uh, Belarusian regime unfolds another round of repressions. Yesterday, about 1,000 people were detained, some tortured. Uh, actually, we don't know very much what's going on uh, in there, but, but Moscow looks for new ways to capitalize on the situation. Uh, what, can we, what can we do? Like, what can the West do? What can the US do in this, uh, in this situation when we, can, when we hear the Belarusian call for, for freedom, actually, right now? Mr. Secretary. Yeah, thank you, Marcin. We, um, uh, I have to say that I have been so deeply impressed and, uh, and, uh, and, and truly uh, can't believe the courage and stamina of the people of Belarus as they mount this push against dictatorship in their own country. It is not lost on anybody. I don't think it's lost on even uh, authorities in Moscow that uh, the ruler of Belarus lost the election in August and simply refuses to give up power. Obviously, Russia has made a decision to seek to exercise influence on the course of events in Belarus. But I think even uh, to some extent, the Russian government has been somewhat reserved as it considers the consequences of deeper engagement in Belarus. First and foremost, uh, I don't think the president of Russia trusts the ruler of Belarus one bit. And I think, I think uh, the leader of Belarus knows full well that as soon as there's a moment of quiet or stability on the streets, the next, the next step is likely his removal. And I don't think he suffers under any illusions that that's the thinking in Moscow. Now, there is some accommodation and transactional uh, relationship that's sustained currently, uh, in which the Russian government is clearly providing security advice, uh, possibly some support behind the scenes, uh, information space support, uh, and uh, also using its influence internationally to try to leave space for the uh, for the uh, ruler of Belarus uh, to survive the current crisis. And I don't know, uh, I don't know if he will or not. Uh, really, so much of this rests upon the ability of those very courageous people in Belarus to maintain that stam stamina uh, week after week to push back. Uh, but uh, the um, you know the the question you ask is what uh, what additional steps can we take? And of course, the United States uh, has had in place for over a decade now significant sanctions against the senior leadership of Belarus, and we expanded those just a, a few weeks ago in coordination with the European Union and the United Kingdom, uh, so as to put in place a strong economic disincentive to the leadership of Belarus. And, and we, like our European partners, continue to look at how we can use those for additional leverage in the case of Belarus. Uh, it's, uh, sanctions alone uh, uh, are not going to be enough to change the course of events in Belarus. It's also going to require uh, the uh, uh, continued efforts of the Belarusian people, as I said, and ultimately the calculations in Moscow. Now, I want to commend the Polish authorities for what they've done to support the Belarusian opposition and, and likewise our, our allies in Lithuania. Uh, in both Warsaw and Vilnius, leading members of the opposition are given refuge while they continue to press their campaign against Lukashenko. But they, we, the people of Belarus, uh, still are up against a formidable, formidable challenge in the Belarusian dictatorship, which holds the levers of power and, and has security institutions, which so far have remained fully loyal to the leadership. But for Russia, it's the biggest question. And I think in Moscow, um, it is a challenging problem uh, to consider that uh, there's absolutely no love and conf no confidence in, in the current ruler of Belarus. Uh, Moscow doesn't like the choice they have there. But if they remove him or they allow him to be removed, they're concerned that they won't necessarily control the aftermath. Ironically, the more they intervene, the less likely they are to have influence because while the Belarusian people are not historically ill-disposed towards Russia, towards Moscow, um, I, think, uh, I think the leadership in Moscow 
if it overplays its hand, could very much turn the people of Belarus against Moscow the same way that most Ukrainians have been turned against Moscow after 2014. So uh, quite the challenge for Moscow. Um, I, I admittedly, a limited ability of Lithuania, Poland, or the United States to uh, influence the course of events other than to provide support and, and, and protection uh, to the opposition. Um, and ultimately, it may very well uh, rest on the shoulders of the Belarusian people. And in a way, that's probably for the best, uh, although uh, they're up against a formidable challenge. The Belarusian people are the ones who deserve the right to select who their leadership will be. That's what they were denied on August uh, in, in the elections in August. And that's what they are entitled to as soon as possible. Steve, thank you so much. And again, we were getting quite a few questions on Belarus, particularly uh, you know, US companies and citizens that have also gotten caught up in, in, in this as well. So thank you for, for addressing that. Marcin, I wanna turn the last question to you and stay on the same topic. While yes, there is much for the Kremlin uh, to, to look at in the, in the post-Soviet space, there's also a huge transatlantic challenge here. We have Belarus at a tragic stalemate. Ukraine, even though there was some movement in the Normandy process, that remains a stalemate. We have Moldovan presidential elections, a runoff, which could, could create some dyna dynamics in, in, in Moldova. We have Nagorno-Karabakh, and we're getting questions about Nagorno-Karabakh, and where is the transatlantic momentum and energy? I think when we witness the courage of, of Belarusian citizens uh, speaking out, risking their own lives for that choice, how can the West be stronger? And it, it feels to me that while Polish diplomacy has, has been active, absolutely, as Steve said, uh, I, I would assume that the, uh, within the EU, Poland would have taken a greater leadership role, but it, it feels that that's, that's not perhaps the case, certainly on Nord Stream 2. We have Lithuania, we have the Germans and the French. Uh, I, I would welcome your reflections on that, and then we will say our farewells. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Of course, I mean, what, what we are witnessing is the destabilization of the of the region, of course, and it's because of the Russian uh, activities in the region. If we, if we follow the six countries of the Eastern Partnership, this program, you know, tailored uh, by the EU to, towards the, the post-Soviet area, which are uh, which are those who are uh, which are not members of NATO or EU, those six countries in every single country. Um, uh, there is there are there are problems internal problems uh, and the interfer interference of uh, uh, of of Russia, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia. We know what's happening. Georgia with the uh, with the two, two parts of I mean two regions uh, taken by Russia. Moldova uh, interference in the in the election, but also with the Transnistria, Ukraine. We all know, and even the Belarus, which was uh, quite stable, I would say, um, uh, recently. Um, uh, is in, 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 in total mess uh, because of the of the decision, um, uh, and I agree with uh, with Steve that uh, Lukashenko is still in power only because of Russia, because of their support, because he has no um, social mandate, he has no uh, 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 people's um, uh, support. Um, uh, it's it's quite obvious that he was not elected in a fair and free election. He was not elected elected as the president of the of the of the Belarus. And the, and the Belarusian nation, they have the right to to choose once again the leader of their of their country. But that, this guy is still in the uh, in the office because of the fact of uh, um, because of the of the Russian um, uh, support. Uh, but it's a risky game, I would say. Uh, that, that's the Soviet mentality, and that's the Soviet game uh, with a with a pure force. I would say. I mean, forcing countries to stay in an alliance, forcing people to doing something. And what's what's the what's the effect? The effect in Ukraine is that the more and more people are anti-Russian or pro-European or pro-American year by year. Um, and I think it, it it will be the same in Belarus. Uh, it was very pro-Russian society, uh, but in in the last couple of months showed that they're anti-Lukashenko. So if they are, and if Lukashenko is supported by Putin, so the people are um, uh, by itself. I mean, they they are changing the mind. They they mind why we are supporting um, Russia if they support our uh, enemy. Why we are doing uh, so? So there is a chance for also for us for the transatlantic uh, community to be more more, more active. Of course, sanctions as uh, as um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Secretary State State Secretary said, sanctions alone are not enough. 
There should be a, a much more, I mean, strategic messaging towards Russia. The first that, I mean, they should not get in. I mean, they should not enter the Belarus. This is the sovereign, um, the sovereign country, but and not only helping uh, to those who are under repression. We are doing this with, uh, with um, uh, in Poland with our Lithuanian friends doing quite, um, uh, quite well. But we need to show kind of positive scenario for those people. There is already third amount. They are protesting every almost, almost every single day or every single week. Uh, on 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 the street fighting for the uh, freedom of the of their own country and there should be some kind of positive uh, agenda for the positive scenario we offered to the you know, to the eu the economic plan for the new democratic belarus that there is something waiting for them if they want to you know, change uh, uh, something in, in in the country it is a european i mean it was uh, tailored by um, by poland supported or backed by v, uh, v4 countries visegrad countries right now it's it's at the level of the european commission but we of course invite also the us to be a bit more active with uh, proposing something positive to that uh, to those um, to those people just to give them the um, the, the chance and the hope uh, that uh, um, something is um, is waiting for, um, uh, for them. So, uh, and of course, sanctions. I mean, we've discussed sanctions uh, for many, many years. Uh, um, sometimes we leave the sanctions, then then we um, go back with a strict policy. Uh, I would say that personal sanctions are not enough, but the economic sanctions are not good. I mean, because we shouldn't target those uh, um, the, the, the ordinary people of Belarus. But there are some entities, some business, uh, some entrepreneurs. Who, who are supporting this Shiloviki? I mean, the, 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 this group of uh, of Lukashenko supporters of, of and, uh, and and the people who are um, responsible for repression. So, and those entities, in my opinion, my personal, also should be sanctioned. I mean, they cannot do just business as usual and then spending the money for beating the people or putting them to the uh, to the prison. Well, Martin, thank you so very much. Uh, this has been such a fantastic way to begin our Transatlantic Forum on Russia with two very thoughtful interventions on all the major key issues. So thank you so much, Under Secretary of State Martin Pashiduch. Thank you, Deputy thank Secretary you of State Steve Began. We appreciate you. And to my colleague, er Ernest uh, Vizikiewicz, we couldn't do it without our colleagues at the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding. So thank you so so very much. Be well, everyone. Take care. And we'll look forward to having uh, more conversations on the Transatlantic Forum on Russia. Thank you so very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.